has given King David a victory over his enemies. David had fled Jerusalem at risk of losing his throne to his son Absalom. But David's men defeated Absalom and his men. It came with a price. Absalom is dead. David is in deep mourning and there's still the matter of returning to the throne that he vacated. Let's see what happens. I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1, reading from the New American Standard Version. Then it was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourns for Absalom. The victory that day was turned to mourning for all the people. For the people heard it said that day, the king is grieved for his son. So the people went by stealth into the city that day, as people who are humiliated steal away when they flee in battle. The king covered his face and cried out with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom! Oh, Absalom! My son, my son! Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, Today you have covered with shame the faces of all your servants, who today have saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, by loving those who hate you and by hating those who love you. For you have shown today that princes and servants are nothing to you. For I know this day that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now, therefore, arise, go out and speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, Surely not a man will pass the night with you, and this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. So the king arose and sat in the gate. When they told all the people, saying, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate. Then all the people came before the king. Not many people could have come to David like this. Joab comes with a hard reality check, basically saying, are you serious right now? You could be dead, your sons, daughters, your wives, and the people who saved your life, you're making them feel like they've done something wrong. You'd be happier if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead. But that wasn't all. Joab gives him an ultimatum. If you don't get up and get out there, with some kind words for your servants, there won't be a single man with you come morning. He even says this will be worse than anything that has come upon you. So David gets up and he goes out with the people. Continuing with verse 8. Now Israel had fled each to his tent. All the people were quarreling throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines, but now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. However, Absalom, whom we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now then, why are you silent about bringing the king back? So the issue is that David left the throne. He didn't formally abdicate, but he fled from Jerusalem and Absalom positioned himself as king with the support of the people. Notice they said Absalom, whom we anointed over us. They anointed him king? I guess God said, oh really? Now that Absalom is dead, the people are quarreling about what to do. They do remember the tiny fact that David has delivered them from their enemies. So some say, why are you silent about bringing him back? Continuing verse 11, then King David sent to Zadok and Abiathar the priests saying, speak to the elders of Judah saying, why are you the last to bring the king back to his house? Since the word of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house, you are my brothers. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? 
say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? May God do so to me and more also, if you will not be commander of the army before me continually in place of Joab. Thus he turned the hearts of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king, saying, Return, you and all your servants. The king then returned and came as far as the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal in order to go to meet the king, to bring the king across the Jordan. David comes up with his own plan for returning to the throne. He appeals to his own tribe, the tribe of Judah, through Zadok and Abiathar the priest. He says, you would be the last to bring back the king, your own brother? He says he will even make Amasa commander of the army in place of Joab. Amasa is the one Absalom had appointed as commander. He is also, by the way, David's nephew and cousin to Absalom as well as Joab. David knows that bringing Amasa on board as commander will help to bring both sides back together. And sure enough, the hearts of the men of Judah turn toward David. They want to bring him back. Continuing verse 16, then Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, who was from Bahiram, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. Remember Shimei, he was the one who cursed and threw stones at the king and his men when they were fleeing Jerusalem. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, with Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and his 20 servants with him, and they rushed to the Jordan before the king. Then they kept crossing the ford to bring over the king's household and to do what was good in his sight. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. So he said to the king, Let not my lord consider me guilty, nor remember what your servant did wrong on the day when my lord the king came out from Jerusalem so that the king would take it to heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come today, the first of all the house of Joseph, to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said, Should not Shimei be put to death for this? Because he cursed the Lord's anointed. David then said, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be an adversary to me? Should any man be put to death in Israel today? For do I not know that I am king over Israel today? The king said to Shimei, You shall not die. Thus the king swore to him. Shimei knew he was in trouble. The law of Moses said in Exodus 22, 28, you shall not curse God nor curse a ruler of your people. Contrary to what Shimei may have thought, here is David still king and there's Abishai still ready to chop off Shimei's head. So Shimei prostrates himself, confesses his sin, pleads for mercy. David is gracious. He says, no man will be put to death in Israel today. He tells Shimei, you shall not die. Continuing verse 24, then Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And he had neither cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came home in peace. It was when he came from Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? So he answered, O oh, my lord the king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go with the king, because your servant is lame. Moreover, he has slandered your servant to my lord the king. But my lord the king is like the angel of God. Therefore do what is good in your sight. For all my father's household was nothing but dead men before my lord the king. Yet 
you set your servant among those who ate at your own table. What right do I have yet that I should complain any more to the king? So the king said to him, Why do you still speak of your affairs? I have decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, Let him even take it all, since my lord the king has come safely to his own house. So first, some time ago, David gave all of Saul's possessions to Mephibosheth and told Ziba and his sons to tend the land. Ziba meets David as he's fleeing Jerusalem with all this food, and he tells David that Mephibosheth stayed in Jerusalem because he thinks his father's kingdom will be restored to him. Right there on the spot, David gave Ziba everything that belonged to Mephibosheth. Now here's Mephibosheth, who appears to be in mourning over David's plight. And he says that Ziba has deceived him and slandered him. And David says, both of you divide the land. He's making snap decisions about a sizable estate this was King Saul's land, and it doesn't quite seem fair to Mephibosheth. But Mephibosheth seems genuinely happy about David's return, so much so that he says, just let him take it all. Continuing verse 31, Now Barzillai the Gileadite had come down from Rogalim, and he went on to the Jordan with the king to escort him over the Jordan. Now Barzillai was very old, being 80 years old, and he had sustained the king while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very great man. The king said to Barzillai, you cross over with me and I will sustain you in Jerusalem with me. But Barzillai said to the king, how long have I yet to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am now 80 years old. Can I distinguish between good and bad? Or can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Or can I hear any more the voice of singing men and women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Your servant would merely cross over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king compensate me with this reward? Please let your servant return that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and my mother. However, here is your servant Chimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king and do for him what is good in your sight. The king answered, Chimham shall cross over with me and I will do for him what is good in your sight. And whatever you require of me, I will do for you. All the people crossed over the Jordan and the king crossed too. The king then kissed Barzillai and blessed him and he returned to his place. So heartwarming, at 80 years old, he helped to supply David and those who were with him with beds and food, which we saw in chapter 17. Now he comes to help escort him over the Jordan, not for personal gain, but because he seems to have a genuine love for David and wants to honor the king in this way. Barzillai turns down the offer that David made to care for him in Jerusalem, and he asks if the kindness can be extended to Chimham, which is likely Barzillai's son. Continuing verse 40, Now the king went on to Gilgal, and Chimham went on with him, and all the people of Judah and also half the people of Israel accompanied the king. And behold, all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why had our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household and all David's men with him over the Jordan? Then all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is a close relative to us. Why then are you angry about this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's expense, or has anything been taken for us? But the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten parts in the king. Therefore we also have more claim on David than you. Why then did you treat us with contempt? Was it not our advice first to bring back our king? 
Yet the words of the men of Judah were harsher than the words of the men of Israel. So we've got tribal jealousies happening here. The men of Israel are comprised of 10 tribes and they are confronting the men of the tribe of Judah who are escorting the king back. They say the men of Judah have stolen him away. Remember, these men of Israel are the same men who were quarreling earlier in the chapter about whether to bring the king back and they never actually made a move to do so. Now that Judah took action, the men of Israel are upset. Now it's a big spat. He's our close relative. Well, we've got 10 parts in him. This will continue into the next chapter and we're seeing a preview of what's to come when the nation of Israel divides in 1 Kings. I wanna go back though and contrast the two Shimmies. In chapter 16, Shimmy came out cursing the king, called him a worthless fellow, told him to get out. He threw stones and dust at the king and all of his men as they walked along the way. Now that David is still king, Shimmy falls down before him. Please don't consider me guilty. Don't remember my wrongs, for I have sinned. And we read that and might think, what nerve? Yeah, of course you're sorry now. Abishai is right. He should be put to death. And I'm reminded that in ourselves, before Christ, we stand guilty before a holy and righteous God. As we live for ourselves, apart from God, indulging in sin, we're raging against God. The Bible calls us enemies of God. And suddenly we see him for who he is, on the throne, king of kings. And we fall down before him, not because we're so wise or so good, but because he's given us grace to do so. He's given us grace to see him, to humble ourselves before him. And we confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. And the enemy says, no, they should be put to death for their sins. And God says, I sent my son to die for those sins. We are shimmy, guilty, deserving of death. But when we place our faith in Jesus, we are saved from death. By grace, we are given the gift of life eternally. Let us praise the Lord for his grace and mercy. Because of Jesus, we can cling forever.